Good morning, everybody. Good morning. ABCs of restaurant financial statements. Woo! This is what we all love to start the day with. So just really quickly again, um, my name is Irene Lee, and I'm the founder of Prep Shift, along with Dylan, um, and the owner of Maymay Dumplings. And um, you can walk into a room and pitch like a man, um, or you can find an incredible person who happens to be a straight white male who wears Patagonia sweaters. Um, <laughs> And he'll do the work for you. Um, so that's us. Um, Prep Shift um, is a consultancy, and we try to help restaurants get their shit together. And we know how to do that in some ways because we've done a little bit of it ourselves. And in Massachusetts in particular, um, we help businesses access up to $30,000 per year to spend on workforce training. So a lot of the times, these are businesses that would not be able to afford consultants. Um, and so basically, we get to hang out with our friends and help them with their businesses, which is really our dream job. Um, before we start, I want to, oh, formatting, OK. Um, <laughs> want to think about what our relationships are to numbers. Does anyone here look at financial statements like all the time? OK, great. Does anyone here maybe look at financial statements less frequently than you probably should? OK, great. We're about half and half. That's awesome. Anyone here a numbers person, self-proclaimed? OK, great. Anyone here definitely not a numbers person? OK. And then maybe some of you are in the middle. You're like me. Numbers are fine. But maybe you're really focused on the people, the food, other elements of running the business. And as Dylan always likes to say, math might not be the reason you got into business, but it might be the reason you lose your business. Womp womp, downer. Um, but <laughs> it is true. Um, and having closed businesses myself, I have learned some of these things the hard way. So. Why can it be really hard to engage with the numbers the way we want to, to make friends with them? Sometimes they are not accurate. Um, and sometimes, even if they are really accurate, they kind of have no meaning. And so at PrepShift, our goal is to make numbers mean something to people. And for years, I did not really like looking at the numbers. Like I said, I was focused on the people, the guests, the staff, the ingredients. And then I found the right people to translate for me. Finance people and restaurant people do not always speak the same language. But when I found the right translator, every single month, I couldn't wait to see the P&L. What a nerd. Um, and so I'm coming to you not as an expert, um, but as a convert. Because learning how to understand the numbers and engage with them totally changed my life and my business. So we're going to talk about the P&L um, really quickly. What's a P&L? What's on it? How do I read it? How should it look if I'm running a healthy business? How do I use it? And how do I make sure it's right? And I'm sure many of you know all of this stuff um, and learned it much earlier and better than I did. And so if that's you, here's what I want you to think about. What would it look like if everyone in my business who worked for me also understood this stuff? Because that's what we did at Maymay with a process called open book management. And again, it totally changed my life. So that's a teaser for a topic we don't have time for today, but I would love to chat with anyone about later. Really quick, um, we're going to go to Dylan and talk a little bit about the P&L and some of the other financial statements. OK. Uh, the three main financial statements uh, that you'll encounter are the balance sheet, cash flow statement, uh, and your profit and loss. And each of those has, has a purpose. Um, but today, as Irene said, we're going to be focusing on the P&L. We think about the, the P&L as a financial scorecard for the business. Um, and there are a lot of different versions of the P&L that are appropriate for different people at different times. But the version we're talking about today is, is the one that's appropriate for management purposes and, and making decisions about how you're going to run the business. This is an example of a P&L where the format has deteriorated. But um, the basic five lines of P&L um, are the revenue minus your expense categories, which are your cost of goods, your direct labor, and your overheads. Um, and that leaves you with your net operating profit, which can be a negative number. OK. That sounds great, Dylan. But how the fuck do I read this? Um, so really quick, um, everyone has seen a P&L that looks like this before? OK, most of us. So um, I wanted to just teach a couple of quick kind of practical skills and maybe some vocab. Um, Usually, a P&L is many, many pages of this snooze fest. So I want to make sure that we all have a little bit of a sense of how we actually read this. So the first thing we do when we're trying to read the P&L is look at these codes here. 
That number 4,000 that goes with sales, that is the chart of accounts reference number. The chart of accounts is basically the code for how we categorize everything on the P&L. And then we can look at a category like catering here. You can see there are a bunch of different categories because we did all kinds of catering at Meme. And um, we do want to be able to see the difference between staffed catering and events and classes and drop off. And as you can see, all of these categories start with four or five because they live under the 4,500 reference number. And in order to see the total of that, we go to the bottom here. And you can see there's um, like an almost useless indentation uh, that is barely perceptible to show you <laughs> what lives under what. Um, nobody taught me this, so I'm teaching you now in case you don't already know this stuff, which you probably do. So when we are looking at this, um, we probably should look at the full P&L really regularly, um, but I don't like to do that, and so I revert back to the five-line P&L. And um, if you're curious, these are Meme's actual numbers from 2019, and if you're interested in transparency, we published all of these in a public event. You can also go to Eater um, and read about our full P&L. You just search my name or how much does it really cost to run a restaurant. All of the info is there. Um, but so. This is the five line, and we could really dive deep into any one of these categories to talk about strategy and improving your business. But for today, we're really just saying the PL is the scorecard, and this is how you keep score. How should a PL look in a healthy business? Um, our industry, like many other industries, has some standard benchmarks for how much of our revenue we should be spending on our bills, right? So yesterday, Jeff talked about um, rent as kind of an 8% benchmark. That falls in this overheads category. You can also see profit and our other expenses. So a simple way to think about this, if you are not a numbers person, is if you bring in $100 in revenue, what should you do with that money? And in a healthy business, about 30% of it would go towards your overhead, and maybe you'd have 10%, sorry, $10 left after you paid all your bills. Uh, brief note, um, anybody here know what primes are? Primes, yeah, OK, maybe, great. So um, our other two major expense categories, cost of goods, that's ingredients and packaging, and direct labor, that's the people and all the things you do to retain the people. Um, those categories are kind of inversely related. So when one goes up, the other one might go down, which means it's really hard to set a standard benchmark for what those numbers should be. So instead, we add them together and we call that primes. So 60% is our benchmark for primes. I want to say really quickly, nobody told me this before I opened my own restaurant. <laughs> nobody is going to make sure that you know it before you open your next business. And so that's why we're here today. Um, Quick note about profit. 10% as a healthy profit margin sounds really good. The missing graphic over here is good. It's a mystery, right? So the actual average profit margin, which it did say here, I promise, um, is between 4 and 6% for an independent restaurant in the United States. And that was before COVID. Shit. So you might be someone who says, I don't need my business to be really profitable. Um, this is my dream. If I can pay myself a salary, take care of my staff, take care of my guests, I, I actually don't think I need to make that much profit. You're probably not in this business for the money anyway. But I do want, oh, hey, there it is. I do want everyone to know that there are a bunch of common and important uses of profit that we don't really think about when we are looking at the P&L. But they are super, super important, as um, Stephanie and Steven shared yesterday. Paying taxes and having cash flow really, really matters. And paying down debt, that's a big one. A lot of restaurant businesses open with debt. And so we need to be able to have profit in order to pay that back. So the way I think about this is a lot of people say, well, we're breaking even. That's great. But breaking even isn't really breaking even. It means you broke even that year. But are you going to have what you need to continue business for another year? Not necessarily. So making use of the financial statements, a lot of folks, when we first work with them, they think that, that these things are for the accountant, they're for tax day. You know, I'm running the business. They handle that stuff. Um, but that would really miss an opportunity. So um, what we encourage clients to do is to review their P&L, even just the five-line P&L, on a monthly basis or some regular basis, as often as you think you can be disciplined to do so. 
um, dig deeper as necessary, tracking key metrics, KPIs, um, and making decisions based on those, that information. And, so, yeah. Just really quickly, making decisions. Does anyone here have a business partner? OK. Does anyone agree with their business partner all the time? OK, great. So <laughs> disagreeing with your business partner is really easy. Disagreeing with the data when you're making decisions about management is much, much harder. And I ran a business with my two siblings, and so I learned that the hard way. This guy looks like he's laughing. He could be crying. We don't actually know. Um, but he is having a response to the numbers. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, um, so an example that kind of ties all this together, we were working with a, a client. Um, they had relatively high uh, cost of goods uh, on an ongoing basis. So they said, OK, we're going to introduce a new menu category. We're going to have the snacks category. You know, we're going to design all these dishes to have low cost of goods. It's going to help solve our problem. Um, so they're making decisions uh, based on the information they see. They implement those changes to the menu. And if they'd stopped there, they would have said, man, we did a great job. Uh, but on, uh, I believe they were on a quarterly basis actually uh, reviewing. So they went back and reviewed their numbers. And their cost of goods actually crept up like a point, point and a half. So it's like, wait a second, like all this effort, you know, we sold a lot of these things, like what happened? Um, so they went back to the team and they figured out the, the microgreens that they were using to garnish these sides um, or these snacks were uh, spoiling very fast. And they hadn't trained the team, like they just rushed to put this out. And so the team didn't really know, nobody was reporting this waste um, and, and that was creating the issue. So they went back to the drawing board, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, redesigned those and then you know, redesigned the systems and ultimately saw the benefit that they, they were seeking. So to get accurate uh, information, timely is important. You know, if you get, are getting a P&L eight weeks later, it's ancient history. It's really hard to make use of that. Um, detail to the extent you need, I think that's a really big one. People, when they like, say, OK, I'm finally going to commit to the numbers, uh, they get excited about you know, seeing every bit of detail. Um, but oftentimes, that leads you to see kind of nothing. So focusing on the areas, um, the detail in the areas that you are focusing on is, is the way to go. Simplify whenever possible. Um, and then formatting, that's, a, I think, a diff difficult one to summarize. Um, but that's something you can work toward with a, a service provider over time to create a P&L that really works for your business. And probably most importantly is having the right people involved. Uh, Uncle Frank is probably not the person to be doing your books, <laughs> paying him in coffee to do it. Um, that's going to you know, hamstring the operation if it hasn't already. Very generally, and, and there are definitely exceptions to this, but you know, bookkeepers are your day-to-day, month-to-month relationship. Your accountant is someone you should speak with less frequently, once, twice a year, something like that. Um, and you know, this is an investment in your business. This stuff can be expensive, especially if you have been paying Uncle Frank coffee to do it. Um, but you know, you're buying yourself time. You're buying yourself knowledge. And if you act on that, um, then, then these things will, will pay off, absolutely. Um, and uh, a quick tip, open your phone, put in, if you are looking for a new accountant, maybe like May or October, a reminder to, to reach out. Um, that fire drill that everybody encounters in like March and April, um, nobody's really going to want to talk to you, and you'll probably get a bad service provider. So uh, one of those times a year is a, a good time to do it. The top of this graphic, uh, the cost per month, um, I think you know, that's just an example. In Boston, for independent restaurants, you know, we're thinking you know, they're doing about a million dollars in revenue. Fairly simple operations. Um, so for some folks, that might be low. For some folks, that might be high. Um, but we wanted to give a range. So for good services, you know, just probably just above Uncle Frank, um, you're probably going to get a cash basis. Uh, we haven't gone into that. But um, basically, that's less useful. The shorter time frame you're looking at is a, a simple way to put it. Accuracy is probably going to be fair to poor. Customization probably non-existent. Um, and then you're going to get the P&L on a very delayed timeline, most likely. You know, that's that eight-week time. If you're in that category, those, th that P&L is probably just for the accountant for tax day. It's probably not going to be very useful for management decisions. The second group, um, probably still cash basis. You know, this is when you're starting to invest real money. If you're doing a million dollars in revenue, this is going to add up. Um, potentially accrual, depending on who you're working with. Accuracy is going to be better. Customization should be there to some extent. And probably most importantly, you're going to get it on a, a more timely basis. Two weeks, I think, is a reasonable expectation after the close of a period. Um, but you know, th that, can, that can vary. And then lastly, if you're starting to spend real money, and, and that plus can go like way up, depending on the concept or the complexity of the organization. But again, for independent restaurants, that's kind of our focus for the most part, about a million bucks in revenue. 700 plus, you ought to be getting accrual. Accuracy ought to be good. Customization ought to be good. Um, and in fact, your, your bookkeeper probably should be like proactive, be like, I see opportunities for 
for efficiency here or you know, to gain insight into an area that I know you're focusing on. Um, so that sort of relationship, if you're paying that money, you should expect that dynamic. And then lastly, on the reports end of things, definitely a P&L, but also like cash flow statements and then custom reports. Um, if you're focusing on the relationship between labor and revenue over given periods of time, uh, asking your bookkeeper to produce those reports on a regular basis is a reasonable expectation if you're, you're paying you know, some good money for it. Back to Great. Um, so hiring a bookkeeper can be hard, right? Because you're not a bookkeeper, so how do you know if your bookkeeper is doing a good job? It's like when you take your car to the garage and they say it's going to be this much and that's the problem and you're like, okay, I guess I have to trust you. So a couple of things that you can look for if you are not sure if you have the right bookkeeper. If you can't identify the five main P&L lines on your report, if it's really jumbled or they're broken up in a weird way. Um, balance sheet items, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. If the income section has things like meals tax, tips, third party fees, those really shouldn't be in that section. And then I think the most important one is if your COGS number contains labor. In a lot of other industries, labor is considered part of COGS, but because our industry um, is so messed up uh, and things are so expensive, it's important to have those two numbers separated. So these are just a couple of um, orange flags, let's say, if you're like, I don't really know if this is the right bookkeeper for me. Um, and going back to this slide, I think we would love for you to kind of ignore cost per month just because it varies so much. But these three sort of columns, I think, are really important to keep in mind. And the most important takeaway is it doesn't cost nothing. It is an investment. Um, last thing I wanted to say before we move on is just a reminder about owner pay. I loved what Ida said yesterday. A successful business can afford to pay its owner. I'm sure many of us have gone underpaid um, or completely unpaid for periods of time. And that can make your business look healthier than it is. So even if you're not paying yourself what you are worth, what you deserve, um, the value that you bring to the business, and your P&L doesn't reflect it, you want to always keep that in mind. And when you finally do get paid, um, you want to make sure that your cost is put into the right places on the P&L. If you are the dumpling maker, kind of felt um, a little attacked yesterday by Stephen, but um, <laughs> if you're the dumpling maker and you're making the dumplings, you should go in direct labor. If you have bought a machine and hired lots of people to make the dumplings, um, then you are focused on marketing the dumplings, um, growing the business, then you may want to put yourself in overheads and maybe you do a split. You say it's 50-50 and all of that is good as well. So ultimately what we're talking about is making sure that your P&L is useful for managing your business because it reflects the reality of what's happening. That's what's going to make you actually want to look at it and what's going to help you make really good business decisions and get everybody else in your organization on board with you. Irene, can I ask you a quick question yeah. on, on uh, direct labor? Is there a place to find definition of that to make sure that you wouldn't get in tax trouble because you're not categorizing yourself in the right way or it's not an issue? That's do a good me, question. Yeah. Do you want me to answer that? OK, sure. Yeah, so from a tax perspective, you know, just because you are allocating it on a P&L in a certain manner, it doesn't mean you're going to present it on the tax return in that same manner. So it doesn't matter. OK, thank you. Thank you. And it's a better, rep what she suggested, what Irene suggested, is a, definitely a better representation of, of the operations. Okay. So before I start, yeah. right, the ABCs, um, I'm going to say that if you rely solely on your P&L, you're not running your business correctly. You have to look at day to day, day daily, weekly, biweekly, monthly information. We're going to talk about technology in the next session. And that technology in most restaurants, most restaurant groups, I don't care if you're one restaurant or you're 150 restaurants, it's underutilized. And it's really important to take that, that investment and utilize to the best of its ability. Because you are making daily decisions. When you get this P&L from whether it be your bookkeeper, your accountant, whoever you utilize, it's old news, right? It's, so if you have a problem, you, you might get it. If Best case scenario, you're going to get it a week after, a week after the month is over, right? That's five weeks have gone by. You made a mistake in, one week, in week one. You continue to make that mistake every single week. So look at all the data that is available to you. I know it could be data overload, but, and they'll talk about that in, tech, in the technology section. But I do believe it's really important to take you know, tidbits from each technology that you have that's important. That's important to your back of the house. That's important to your front of the house. That's important to ownership. And take that and absorb that and utilize it to make 
decisions, right? To make educated decisions. Information is power, right? So you're not going to be able to make those educated decisions if you're looking at a P&L five weeks after the fact. Because it's, it's history, right? That's what, that's what accountants do. That's what bookkeepers do. We record history. That's all we're doing. We're not being pro Modeling, that's a different story. But that's, I just want to throw that out there. And they'll talk about that later on. But I think it's really important that you, that you all understand that. My friend from Wichita, she said the best thing yesterday. She said, she said, day one, you've taught us, day one, you've taught us how to get the money. Day two, you're going you're gonna to teach us how to not to F it up. So that's what we're <laughs> Right. OK. So I'm going to just talk, I'm going to, because I know we're going over controls, but, but um, you know, financials and operations later. But I do want to um, touch upon these things, right? So there's five areas that you really can control, right? That you are giving your team that they could really control, right? There's, so there's a really only five areas, revenue, cogs, labor, operating supplies, and repairs and maintenance, right? Other, the other things are somewhat, let's say, overall immaterial, somewhat immaterial to, to the you know, overall scheme of, of the financials. And these, so if you get these five things right, you're, you're going to get your business right. That's at, at the end of the day. Right? We always look at the numbers as a per, uh, percent of revenue. Right? And why is that a, the best approach? Anybody? Let's make this interactive. I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask a question to, to, to the audience and raise your hands. Who would rather sell chicken at a 20% margin or steak at a 35% margin? Who would want to sell chicken? Is the margin the profit or the margin the cost? The cost. Who wants to sell chicken? Who wants to sell steak? Why do you want to sell steak? Money. Exactly, right? <laughs> Percentages don't pay the rent. Cash does, right? How much you you have to look at your contribution margin, right? So it is your your what's what's contributing? What's the cash contributing? So while we we talk about percentages all the time, right? That my labor wants to be thirty five percent, or my my cogs are twenty five percent. You know, you can't get. You have to look at what you're actually selling, right? You actually like I'd rather sell. A hundred dollar bottle of wine or a hundred and fifty dollar bottle of wine than a twenty dollar bottle of wine every day. Every day. I'd rather sell steak and scotch. That's what every concept should be if they want to make money. They're not gonna make ten percent, they're gonna make, I don't know, forty percent if they did that, right? So those are the things I well, numbers, percentages are very, very important and they should be looked at. There are other factors involved that you should be looking at. Other fact all, all the time. You should be looking not just labor as a percentage of just overall sales. You should be looking at labor as a percentage of covers. So there are other metrics that you should be looking at which technology enables. Your POS is bountiful of technology. It's not an overpriced cash register. It has a lot of good data in it that you guys should be utilizing, gals, should be utilizing to run the business, right? The importance of understanding inventory management and COGS. So important. That's part of the one of the five things, right? Technology helps you do that. You also want to make sure that when you, if you have a new concept or you're looking at your concept, that you're pricing things correctly. When you tell your executive chef, some of you are executive chefs, but when you say, I want a 28% food cost, what does that even mean? Like, how are they supposed to even know that, right? Right? It's your theory. You have to start out with how you're pricing that, right? So it's theoretical, right? Your theoretical cost. Right? And that's, and you have to, they have to know what's in the recipe, right? What the recipe costs, what you're pricing it at. And that's their baseline, right? So are their portions too big? Is there too much waste? Are you, do you have too many, you know, are you, they're making too many mistakes? They're throwing things away or it's comps, whatever the situation is. You know, why is, you know, are they not buying correctly? Why are the actual costs? When we, we're expecting as owners, you're expecting as owners, I'm going to have a 28% food cost. What? And then you come, the, the, you know, the end of the month, you have a 30% food cost, right? Well, why? You know, there's a host, of, there could be a host of reasons why. But these are the things you have to understand. You have to give your people the proper tools in order to be successful, right? So you have to give them, whether it's technology or just teaching them, teaching them how to achieve that 20%, that 28%. To your point, Irene, when she opened up the books to her team, 
right? And so everybody understands the P&L. We all share in the P&L. Well, first of all, it gives them a sense of ownership, right? The best managers act like it's their money, right? The best executive chef and the best you know, front of the house, they act like it's their money. That, that's, those are going to be the most profitable companies. But also, they take ownership, right? They take ownership. And these P&Ls, typically, there's bonuses. There's investment decisions made, made from that, bonuses, you know, a whole host of things. Going into a new revenue line, how are we going to fund a new restaurant, right? All these different things. If you're waiting for stale information, if you're not on the day-to-day, -day, you're not going to be able to make those, those decisions. You know, to your point, to the quarterlies, you know, we thought we were doing great, and then we looked at it quarterly. With three months later, that's ludicrous, right? Um, Percentages don't pay the rent. It went that cash on the shelf. What does that mean? Does anybody know what cash on the shelf means? What does it mean? Could be, it could be inventory. More often, it's supplies, right? It's supplies. Everybody, oh, I saved a penny on this napkin. You know, I saved, you know, I saved, 100, I saved 100 bucks, so I'm going to buy. She's shaking her head. I'm going to buy 10,000 of them. Oh, we're rebranding. We're throwing those away, right? So operating supplies are, are big cash. I call that cash on the shelf. Right, timing of when, and you see on the P and Ls, right? You see operating supplies go like this. You know, whether it's back of the house or the front of the house, they're all over the place because people are not mindful how they're purchasing those. So that's something that you should be going over with your team, right? So uh, learning how to fish, like I, I said this before. You know, labor, fixed fixed wages, hourlies, cost of goods sold, plates, beverage costing, portion control, waste, inventory managed. Perfect. You, te you have to teach your people how to fish. Because if you don't teach them how to fish, you're, you're, n you're not going to be successful. You can only micromanage so much. And especially when you go on to restaurant two, three, four, hopefully. Right? You can't be in four different places. Right? The, your restaurants will outgrow you. So the importance of that. So that's just you know, kind of highlighting a couple of things. I know I'm supposed to talk about the balance sheet. I will. Right? <laughs> Comps and desk. You know, this I'm not, I'm not going to go over because I know, um, we're, you know these are just you know, highlighting comps and discounts. Not all comps are created equally. Um, knowing what to comp because that's the, co you know, the actual cost. Cost of sales, labor and training, controllable costs, EBITDA. These are the, the major areas which you'll get in the slides. OK, balance sheet, knowing your balance sheet. So why is it important to understand your balance sheet? None of you look at it. Like the vast majority of you don't look at your balance sheet. It's something like, uh, you know, it's P&L, P&L, P&L. Important, but guess what? If your balance sheet is wrong, your P&L is wrong, yeah. right? And what you, what you think you're making, you're not making. So it's important to understand, this is a very long list. I understand that. There's a lot of, you know, we try to incorporate as much as possible. A lot of this could be, you know, in, not applicable, but most of it should be applicable, right? So if your balance sheet is wrong, it's wrong, right? The cash you think you might have, right, that you think you have, you may not have. Not, it might not. And why, why is that? Right? Why, is, why is, you know, the, you, you, see on your, you see on your balance sheet, I have $100,000 in the bag. Woohoo! I'm doing awesome. Your debt sits there, of what you're carrying from your debt, your depreciation sits there, everything else sits there and balances so all your, your liabilities are sitting there, your accounts payable is sitting there that you still Ex owe. Exactly. So the days of, it used to be, I remember when I met operators probably, I don't know, it's going on, you know, 20 years ago. I'm really aging myself. But 20 years ago, it was like, oh, I just look at my cash account. That's all I look at. And if I have cash in the bank, I'm doing fine. Well, great, but like you also have, you know, you have outstanding checks that, you know, haven't cleared the bank. So your $100,000 may be $90,000, right? You might have deposits in transit. Right? You might have deposits that have, haven't hit that bank, um, bank account on the day. But you have in that money, in that cash that you have, what do you have? You have sales tax. Right? You've collected sales tax. You're just a fiduciary on behalf of the state that you're in. So that's not your money. Right? You have customer deposits. That's the best, customer deposits. Everybody, oh, I mean, if you're doing a lot of catering right, and you require a deposit, you have this big, like all this cash in the bank. Well, guess what? You know what's yours? The margin that you make on that event. That's it. That's all yours. So if you make a 25% margin, you got 100 bucks. Only $25 is yours, right? The $75 is, should, because eventually you're going to have to pay for that, right? And when the event actually happens, 
and you said, oh, I've distributed the money, or I've done this or that with the money. Oh, I opened up, I'm opening up a new restaurant. Well, who's going to pay for all the expenses associated with that catering event, right? And then, you know, so we have, you know, all these different gift cards. Another one, gift cards. We love gift cards, right? We love gift cards, but then people are going to come in and use those gift cards. We love gift cards that people don't use, right? We love those, right? It's like the gym memberships. We love, the gym owners love when people don't come to their gym, right? It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing, gift cards, right? Gift cards, we pile up, especially in December, right? December, all the teachers are getting gift cards, right? Well, that's a liability. That's a liability that, you're, so that cash, again, is not yours. What, how much of that is yours? Your margin. That's what's yours. Whether it's 10%, 15%, 20%, that's, that's all that's yours. Right? And then taxes. My favorite. I'm a tax accountant. Yeah. Don't forget Uncle Sam. Right? Don't forget Uncle Sam. So that cash that you have, you have to realize if you're profitable, which I hope you all are, and God bless, right? We're all profitable. That's awesome. Well, we have to pay Uncle Sam. Right? So we have to put money aside. Right? So if we, we have to put money aside for taxes, we have to put money aside for, for you know, emergencies. Like, you know, you, the cash that you have is not the cash you have. So I think that's important. And I think it's important also, Irene's point to everybody understand, understanding in their organization, understanding how their actions, what they're doing, their day-to-day -day actions, translate to what happens on the P&L. My biggest line is the numbers don't lie. I don't care what you tell me how great your restaurant is. If you're not profitable, you're not, you're not gonna be around, you're not, you're not a great restaurant. You might be a beautiful restaurant, you might have excellent food, but if you're not profitable, you're not a good restaurant. That's what it comes down to, because the numbers don't lie. The first story that you tell your, right, the romance, your, your ro Jen, right, we're romancing, our, our investors, we're telling, they're investing in us as people. That's awesome. But then the expectation is that we're going to be profitable and pay them back. And we have to concentrate. Like the romance, you know, it's, it's like, you, you know, the, the, the honeymoon's over, right? The honeymoon's over, now you get into the marriage, right? Where the real work happens. And, th and that's what you all have to consider.